So Margaret Sullivan is a national thought leader in assisting public libraries uh, envision their preferred future. Margaret leads Margaret Sullivan Studio, a full service strategy and design firm collaborating with innovative library systems internationally. Since the firm's founding in 2014, MSS has become the industry leader in re-envisioning the 21st century library for diverse and complex contemporary communities with a focus on social justice and racial equity. In 2017, Margaret was named one of Interior Design Magazine's rising stars. In Delaware, Margaret has been meeting with public library directors and will share input on potential possibilities for delivering services through library outdoor spaces. Margaret will also update us on current national library trends resulting from the pandemic and projections into the future. So take it away, Margaret. Thanks, thanks, Annie. Um, so good to see all of you all. I'm gonna um, share my screen. Um, and I'm loving all the accomplishments in the chat. So, um, so keep those coming because I think when we all come together, it's such a great opportunity to celebrate achievement. Um, I'm delighted to speak with you all today. Keynote always feels a little overwhelming, um, but what I have always enjoyed about um, coming together and speaking um, at these types of convenings is that um, you know we want to sprinkle in a little bit of fun, um, a little bit of reality sharing, a little bit of inspiration, and a good dose of energizing. Um, so hopefully, even in our Zoom digital world, those vibes um, that we get when we come together um, will be um, part of what we're doing today. Um, I'm going to take you all on a journey um, that's going to be about a three-part journey today. Um, around where we are, um, where we're going, um, what opportunities we have, and then we'll get to touch down on giving you all, I know some of you all have been talking to my team, um, but give you all a glimpse of how we're taking those conversations and making meaning and opportunities. Um, as Annie said, um, our firm, Margaret Sullivan Studio, works um, all over the country, and it's just such a great joy to see how varieties of communities are serving their communities and our opportunity to help in strategy um, and physical space design to activate community experiences. And I think one of the things that, that our work has introduced to the library design and strategy industry has been creating methodologies that really answer that call to action of um, that term looking outward. Um, and so we build our work around the questions, what is the community, what is the vision for the community that we um, as, you know, just really special, a special type of community service um, provider um, and servant leader for our communities, um, what what can we do um, as with our expertise and our resources and skills and talents as libraries? And by continuously asking that question, um, we're coming up with new models of service and more meaningful, um, deeper mo models of service um, with the strengths that we already have. And Delaware libraries, you know, up, down, and sideways have just such strengths. But we all know that. Um, you know, never waste a good crisis, um, that the opportunity that we're seeing in urgency, of urgency in our communities through the pandemic um, is, is giving us new types of information and understanding to know that we are in constant transformation um, to create um, opportunities and services and programs and physical space design that are the foundational and can be the foundational social fabric in our communities, much like our friend Eric Kleinenberg. Um, and I don't know in the chat, how many of you all um, are familiar with Kleinenberg's book, Palaces for the People? Um, Cause that's been on the, on the ALA circuit for a while. Um, but just his, his call to action for all of us that our spaces, our programs and our services 
are critical in creating the places to foster community inclusion. Um, and the Knight Foundation has done a great bit of work with reimagining the Civic Commons, which is another good resource for us. Um, but we know that we're at a really um, interesting time. And the way that I've been describing the, the world we're in, um, and y'all think about this, um, and I'm gonna let you all do some chats but I've been organizing where we are in three modes. So the first is this mode of rapid relief. And we're seeing the need for stabilization in housing, stabilization in food insecurity. We're seeing um, small businesses close or be in jeopardy at um, exponential um, degrees. And so we're seeing some of the things that we've always seen in the library world of um, in the socioeconomic insecurities in our communities really bubble up with urgency. Um, and then number two is we're seeing how stabilization is really important. So that's thinking about how our communities need our services and need us to pivot to offer materials, resources, technology, the digital divide, um, but even just the relationships that we've had in our communities, we want to continue in new ways through virtual programming um, and through outreach. Um, and then I think there's also the, the bigger picture is what is this opportunity now to think strategically, to think long-term um, to how our library programs and services can really make an impact on um, building the social infrastructure. So in the chat, <clears throat> I'd love for you all to just spend about five minutes thinking about how your mindset around this rapid relief, stabilizing communities um, and creating um, thinking long-term. So one is, is urgency and immediacy, what were some of the programs and needs you're seeing in your communities? The two, what you're doing in that stabilization mindset mode, um, what, what did they miss from you that you know you're needing to deliver to continue those relationships? And three, what are some um, long-term opportunities you're seeing as, as you're learning more about what your communities are experiencing right now? And we'll do that for about two or three minutes more. Oh, I like meeting people where they are comfortable. Um, oh, the need for ebooks and e audios. Oh, STEM kits. The, the take and makes, those are just popular everywhere. Oh, I love, Leslie, I love your comment working together, um, even understanding more deeply how coalition building and working together with community organizations is critical. Always stronger and more effective when we combine our strengths, yep. The digital divide, Susan, your comment is, is really speaking to that. Great. 
Right. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep going, but y'all have got some great ideas. Um, so I think just reinforcing what we know, um, this is such a great time to just have confidence that what we're doing actually has significant impact to building community resiliency and recovery. And I have learned from recently from a, the deputy mayor of New Orleans post Katrina that the characteristics of communities that got out of the Katrina crisis faster were ones that organized more effectively um, and then were, were stronger at community engagement because they were building their own advocacy and problem solving skill sets. So when, when he um, said that, it made me think, what is our role as libraries in this coming out of the pandemic? Um, and then he also said that they know as deputy mayors that the preventative programming for youth, for families, for workforce, for English as a second language are strengthening communities. And so I thought with that statement, we, we can bring to our work the confidence that what we contribute to our communities has significant value um, to create the pathways for community, for constructive engagement and constructive organizing to build community trust. Um, so our engagement with our communities, the programs that we facilitate, provide and offer are keys to community real resiliency. And that our vision doesn't change. Our vision is still strong um, to develop the communities um, with our values doesn't change. Um, no matter how much we have to pivot, these are the constants um, that we wake up every single day um, to deliver for our community. Um, and so I think it's always good to go back to what the values, the mission and the vision are. Um, and we're gonna stop here with mission because I do wanna continue that question around what are we most proud of um, in our accomplishments? So I'd love for everyone also in the chat to take about two or three minutes um, and, and let's celebrate with each other what your, um, most proud accomplishment is in the pivot, in our pivot era. I'm gonna write it in. What is your proudest accomplishment in pivoting? The staff coming together. And I, Bonnie, I love the identification of to meet the needs of the community too. Virtual help for jobs and basic needs, that's great. finding new ways to safely serve the community. Well, isn't the, the safety piece is a curveball for us every single day. Working closer together to coordinate staff services. A lot of these comments are just about the staff, you know, really coming together to serve community needs that they're saying it's great. And Carl, your high quality program. So continuing um, in the level of excellence um, as you're finding new ways to. Yeah, the virtual world work. I mean, we're, we're in it. We're gonna have skill sets around um, virtual production that are gonna benefit us for a very long time. We're now a media company. The little free libraries have new meaning. That's so true. And then continuing to do the, the um, hands-on activity-based programs, I think has also been a great, identify, Scott, you're identifying that as well. 
And then Pamela, keeping the activities online. Um, I think that's great. Great, good, thank you all. Um, so here we go. We just we just started the. Um, you all know better than than we do even all the wonderful things you're doing. Um, but the um, celebrating your accesses to the virtual world, how you're activating your curbside services to be more than just transaction, but to be community driven, um, and to continue to build those relationships. Um, and then knowing critically that the social services are such a strong asset um, in the infrastructure that Delaware Libraries has already been building pre-pandemic um, has been to, in our work nationally is one of the great strengths of Delaware Libraries. So y'all should be very proud of that. Um, so I wanted to just do a, do a um, tour of the country. Um, and some of the things that um, libraries are doing around the country that are interesting. Um, Denver Public Library and Portland um, Public Library are um, doing um, digital technology centers outside. They were one of the first to start doing those programs, activating the outdoor space for technology labs, knowing that that was one way that they could access, get folks accessing um, technologies that they needed for any variety of um, social services needs. Um, and then also there's been such a huge awareness that we, we do need to get into the mental health and well-being game in our communities because um, that's become an urgent need for all of us. Um, and that Broomfield just found, I swear to you, they found um, a ban in the junkyard and then they just decided they wanted to be a free wi-fi bus they didn't wait for a grant they didn't wait for the money they just a whole bunch of people just kind of went rogue on the director and went out there and found this um old van and put this um, vinyl on it and became the wi-fi distribution hub um, right after the pandemic places like prince george's county um, are um, creating these virtual events that, and I think we're in this era of a new type of consortium. So Prince George's worked with all of the libraries in Maryland to host Dr. Kendi. And I think, have y'all hosted him yet? Y'all are hosting him this month or November, right? Um, when we all thought we were gonna be able to come together again, but we aren't. But, um, but what was great about this was that because all the libraries in Maryland work together, 200,000 people signed up from this for this event all over the world. So that's an amazing reach that our virtual programs can have. Um, and it's just rem remarkable that 200,000 people signed up. I think social services are realizing that library facilities are a really important distribution um, hub. So social services partnered with the Cleveland Public Library to give out backpacks and to get folks ready for school. Um, they've been doing a program called PCs for the People where um, computers are refurbished and it's like the goodwill for computers. So inexpensive hardware can be sold and the libraries are partnering um, with PCs for the People to get those distributed. So our facilities are distribution centers and um, we're seeing that amp up um, in our work. Vegas, Clark County is doing some really cool things. They actually, you know, closed maybe for like a month. So their buildings were one of the first in the country to open. And I know some of you have also do have open buildings. Um, but one of the things that they did was they partnered with the city to offer virtual school. So they have a K through 12 school um, that allows particularly families of essential workers to drop their children off at the library. Um, and the, the families know that they are taken care of um, by throughout the day. They also realized that the, the families were dropping the kids off at 7.30, even though they originally opened at 8.30 in the morning. And they changed their opening to 7.30 to accommodate the needs that they were seeing in the community. So I think that's also an interesting thing that's happening 
We know that we're, um, we own a special place in social and community development. Um, we are the institution that advocates and represents the health and well-being of our community members. I would argue most effectively. Um, and we're at an era where um, we celebrate the diversity and equity in our communities. We connect and we collaborate and catalyze those convenings with our community partners um, to celebrate um, and build community and cultural relevancy. Um, and that's a really strong value proposition that we bring um, to this recipe um, of the 21st century library that hasn't changed even in this pandemic era that at the center of our work are our community members, um, the programs and services that they need that we can provide with our partners creates that library experience. And that we are, whether we're doing it virtually or whether we're doing it in place, we have this great benefit as community developers um, to build experiences around human-centered, customer-centered, community-centered um, activities and programs. And um, so we use the term placemaking because it, it really is like, um, I always use the example, think about the best dinner party you ever hosted. And you know that you greeted people with a smile, you made careful selections on the table that you set um, and you, you made sure everyone left having, having had a good time. And that's really the privilege that we have each and every day, whether we're offering a service um, at a place, outside, or online. Um, so, you know, one of the things that we've been thinking about is how do we take all the great things that we were doing inside of our facilities and pivot to create experiences both outside, which is we're learning is, is safer, and how do we create those experiences online. So some of the things we've been looking at, and this is the work we've been doing with you all, um, is this was a preliminary project that we did for the Richland Library early in the pandemic, but thinking about all of the things that they had been doing, which you see on the right, um, they had already started doing outdoor programs by taking their mobile program bus around town um, to activate outdoor experiences. And then using that as the impetus to start um, translating how they could take those activities and programs and apply them to their facilities and locations, um, knowing that, that being able to, to operate fully inside might take, a, might take us a year um, before everyone's comfortable in that role. Um, so then I'm going to take us on a different type of journey, and we call it lateral thinking. Um, so one of the things that we do is we, we call it look all around us. Um, and what are we seeing in our community experiences outside of our library world that are informing the ideas and opportunities that we have for our programs and services? So I'm going to ask you all again to do a chat interactive. Um, and I want everyone to try to remember what was your first experience kind of as we were coming out of um, pandemic shelter in place, what was your first retail experience? And my first retail experience was going to a local bookstore downtown in Judson, which I'll tell you all about in a second, but take two minutes and let's put in the chat your, what you remember about your first retail experience. <laughs> so, so, oh, so some of them were, were not positive necessarily. 
And also the awareness of how we were feeling, like what kind of how we were feeling safe or not safe. Um, Yeah, the, the heightened nervousness, right? That I remember feeling that way too. So good. <laughs> So I think, you know, I think it's good to be mindful of how we're feeling because that's the being in um, other people's shoes that helps us create intentional experiences. Um, my first experiences were actually very positive and um, the bookstore that I went into, they were, they had a sign at the beginning, you know, at the at the front that said, welcome back. But I love this one that was helping them manage the crowd control, um, just positive vibes coming out. And then when I asked them how they were managing the crowds, they said, you know, every single day it's different and they're learning in real time, which all of us are. So I thought that was great insight. But one of the things they did that I thought was really fun was that they invited folks as kind of families or you know the pods so pods could come in and have um, sh shopping experiences unique customized shopping experiences initially um, I've been going on a trail I'm in Greenville South Carolina right now though I also live in New York which you'll see me going there in a bit um, but I've been going on a trail that connects um, 20 miles of the city and so many people are outside doing cultural things like Native American drumming and African dancing. And that's been a great joy to see. Um, now we're, I'm taking you to New York City um, where this nonprofit called Street Lab is putting all of these kind of homework help and play modules in the streets. Um, and it's activating communities in ways that they're coming together, um, which has been fabulous. Um, and even taking that up to the Bronx, um, the Third Aven Avenue Business Improvement District is putting games out on the streets for families, um, particularly while the weather has still been good. Um, and the streets are just becoming these wonderful playgrounds um, that started with um, get retail and restaurants being able to spill out on the streets. Um, but as that's happening, people are really realizing that's giving everyone a sense of hope um, that we folks can come together in an alone together sort of um, safe way. You know, in libraries, we do that every single day alone together, um, but also opportunities to bring people together for salsa dancing um, and cultural celebrations up in the Bronx, which has been great to see. Um, Tara, I know some of you all have met us online, but that's Tara and me doing a um, community relief effort um, distribution event in the Bronx. And again, I think that gets us back to what's, what is our most critical role as it relates to rapid relief um, opportunities in our communities. And then I'm also on the board of a nonprofit, which did something really wonderful this year. Um, typically, we have a weekend in October where over 40,000 people roam the streets of New York City and go venture into cool architecture buildings. Um, this year, we couldn't do that. So we, had, we also had to pivot and go virtual. And one of the things we did that I thought libraries could really like totally steal um, is we did a um, scavenger hunt throughout the city based on four areas of focus, health, diversity and representation, learning and knowledge, um, and dignity. So there were all these great sites that we identified and the community has been doing the scavenger hunts. Um, and they, the nice thing about what y'all are doing with all the virtual programming is you're building content that can live forever. Um, and so we're repackaging these scavenger hunts as holiday gifts um, for members and, and, and the community. So y'all ready to, to get into y'all's applications? We're gonna end on, this is the last part of our presentation.
So Tara, I'm going to let you also speak to the work we've been doing. Um, we have been all over the state, um, both physically, we've driven the state and popped in on some of y'all's libraries, um, but virtually we've been meeting with many of you all. Um, and we've been looking at opportunities to activate um, the outdoor experiences um, and really take that concept of what you're doing, um, what you've been doing pre-pandemic, marry it with the opportunities that we have um, through seeing the, the real needs and urgencies in our communities and also tapping into the opportunities that we have um, long-term um, to activate the exterior um, well after we're all comfortable um, getting being safe and secure inside. So one of the first communities that we want to talk about is Frankfurt. Do we have do we have our Frankfurt representatives? Oh, if you're if you're here, um, say hello in the chat. Um, and you you all are just getting a glimpse at some of the draft um, document. Hey Bonnie, um, draft of the document that we're presenting. Um, and so you're going to see the framework in which we're taking the, the conversations that we've had with you all um, to create ideas. Um, so the, the first part of the framework is we're identifying the community needs and what we're learning about the community. Um, and you'll see how we're making a creating a description and then we're identifying some of the outcome goals that we're hearing. Um, so Bonnie, you can you can tell us if we're getting it right um, in this preliminary draft. Um, and then we're identifying some of the highlights that we're hearing about the demographics in the communities. Um, and then we have a page for partnership opportunities, which we're, we'll be filling in. Um, and then we also have an, an area where, um, particularly with Nick's interest um, in identifying sustainable opportunities um, for each one of the projects. And then what we're doing is we're translating some, what we've been hearing from you all about opportunities for programs and activities as it relates to strategic objectives. And then this center part, and you see we're still in draft mode, so we, we're, we don't have it listed as Frankfurt, but that's what, um, this is the Frankfurt recipe um, for the opportunities around the role and purpose is what we call it. Um, to activate the outdoor experiences for the programs and activities that are meaningful for each one of your communities. Um, and then you start to see how we translate that strategy into the big picture diagram um, of the areas of focus translated in the scope, scope of work floor plan of the exterior front yard, side yard, um, the area and the, the parking area and then how these activities can be translated um, in the spaces and places to foster the activities and programs like community gathering but also foster those qualitative experiences that we do well such as insight the imagination um, and then the other thing that we've been doing is that lateral thinking um, looking at what are the opportunities and the feelings um, that we want to evoke in these experiences to get our, our minds flowing with excitement of opportunities. Um, and then we start to apply it to um, a reality with furniture um, and spaces and places in the programs. And Tara, I'm gonna let you um, speak to this because um, you've, you've been the impetus for so many of these great ideas. Right. So yeah, um, in like both option A and option B, we were thinking about possibly activating the front yard. So we know that um, you guys asked for a solar powered gazebo. So we have it um, sketched at the top where you could possibly have like improv groups and then give out free lunches. And we're also thinking about having, I know that um, safety against like the road was a um, concern. So we're thinking about these 
partitions that could um, be beautiful, but still partition off from the roads. And on the left, we're thinking um, of like a possible story walk with separate frames. And then we know you guys have a butterfly garden. So possibly like thinking about how the stories from the story walk could tie to your butterfly gardens. And then the two options are showing like the activation of the parking lot. So the left is using um, the majority of the left parking lot behind the building and then leaving a lot of parking space on the right, the staff parking, and then vice versa in the um, option B. So keeping computers close to um, the building and the option on the left, and then having um, a community living room in the back um, and I'm looking at the picture on the left, and then having a maker space on the right, and then an option B, saving the parking lot um, behind the building for patrons and staff, and then um, activating the parking lot on the right for all the programs and the activities. So that's our preliminary um, pass at the translation of um, ideas and activities and programs for both you know those rapid relief efforts as well as opportunities for surprise wonder and delight um, and then of course we get it real and we start putting dollar figures to it so that that can inform um, the asks um, and the opportunities um, with future capital funding um, that this work will have um, georgetown is another great community um, that we've learned about. Um, and it also has opportunities to both activate the area of the actual library facility, but also um, we've, we've been told that we could start to look at activating an area that's actually part of the town, which is a great way to think about outreach and partnership opportunities. Um, and again, we are starting to identify the unique diversity um, in this community with its immigrant population. Um, and the opportunities for outcomes and partnerships. And if, if we've got our Georgetown representatives here, definitely give us a shout out um, about what you're seeing. Um, and then again, um, Georgetown has a, has, is translated into what its areas of focus are, um, literacy and learning, digital literacy is big, um, and then opportunities for entertainment um, and personal development and growth. Um, and then we start to see two different opportunities um, for activating those areas of focus, both in zoning um, and then in programming. Um, and also very similar, you know, we've got our, the look and feel and the opportunities um, that we can have. Particularly, we're going to show you where there might even be opportunities for even community to do crafting to create um, ceilings and umbrellas um, above the space because y'all got that por porch um, to work with, which is kind of fun and cool. Um, and then, you know, we have to be practical. So we started looking particularly underneath that porch area where the existing electrical outlets are um, to focus the um, opportunities for the computers, the digital literacy, um, the access to technology um, in those areas and spaces. Um, and then thinking about the porch area as the opportunities for community development, um, communities coming together, the reading, a reading room in this scenario, um, a game space in this scenario, um, but just, you know, layering, um, layering these programs and activities that we've been doing so well on the inside of our buildings and seeing all the opportunities for outside. And then here you can see us taking that idea of something that can be designed for a covering that represents the unique culture and community um, and cultural relevancy. Um, that right now the building doesn't necessarily represent or reflect the culture of so many of the immigrants that are there today. And then the, the pop-up outside. Tara, do you wanna to speak to this one? This is, you, you've had such fun with this roundabout. Sure. Yeah, so one of the ideas that we had while we were in Georgetown was that you guys had the circle, which is the um, like a cute roundabout um, 
down the street from the library. So it would be like a really great place to activate um, and possibly have a story walk from the library to the circle. And then um, with permission, we could get, um, we could activate the circle and have different opportunities. Like we could have um, like an art corner where people could come and draw. We could partner with um, local businesses or they could set up tents and like sell local artwork or food, um, et cetera. And there could be games and also like a reading corner, the library could lend some of its resources and then have like a pop-up library event in the circle. And then we've got some associated costs here too that we're starting with. And then last but not least is Rehoboth. Um, Tara and I spent about four hours on a Saturday afternoon in Rehoboth enjoying the beach town. Um, so we came away with lots of ideas um, that you'll see here that that I think the, the fun thing about these ideas is that we could probably all see um, ourselves because this is one of the most robust um, that we've developed so far um, in terms of areas and scope. Um, and, you know, I think Rehoboth is probably an interesting community um, because it's, it is affluent, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the library is necessarily serving the most affluent population. Um, so we've learned a lot about what is popular, um, what works well at Rehoboth. And or, um, again, shout out if you're representing this library. Um, but the themes that we were developing here, curiosity, entertainment, digital literacy, and personal development. So you start to see how they're morphing um, with, each, with each one of the community's um, unique conditions. Um, so you see um, we have, in the building itself, um, how we're activating both the, the main level and then the upper level um, porch that's part of the building. Um, the look and feel and some activities and programs um, that we're inspired by. Um, and then um, and then the um, area here, um, about the um, the lower level and the upper level, um, and do you want to say do do you want to interrupt me about the um, a few words about planning for NCC? You want to go for that? No, fit, well, this is good morning. This is Diana. Yeah. No, go ahead and finish with Rehoboth because all the the three libraries you've covered are in Sussex County. Oh, okay, okay. And I've noticed that I have a, a lot of Newcastle County library staff and library advisory board members, so they might be curious, you know, where Newcastle County is. So I just- Okay, awesome. with thank, you. thank you, Diana. Um, so um, we're looking at on the lower level, thinking about the, um, you know, bringing in that notion of play and fun that's so beach town. And then on the upper level, that continuation of some of the core programs and services that are more conventional um, with libraries. Um, and so this is where we started getting a, uh, having a lot of fun with thinking about taking over parking, which is always a fun conversation um, to have. But there are, in Rehoboth, there's the, um, the alley that has um, some parking spaces that particularly like on Saturday mornings, for example, there could be a takeover. Um, to think about families coming together for games, for movies, um, and then even for like community meals. So we're starting to look at different um, activities and programs that could activate that space that had, you know, when we started doing this kind of work, you start to see that there's the variety of programs um, that people can even bring their own chairs, you know, so thinking about beach towns where you have your own furniture, um, that you could set up. Um, and then we started thinking about how we could have the, the consortium of games that just traveled around the whole state um, to activate the outdoor spaces. Um, so it starts to help us think about opportunities that we don't necessarily have to own, but that we can create the conditions for. 
So with this, I think it'd be kind of fun. Y'all just in your in your minds start thinking about you know ways that you're activating your spaces with these ideas as well. And then this is where we got really crazy and we started taking over um, an empty lot um, that's next to the restaurant on the other side of the library. Um, and again, the idea isn't necessarily that the library has to own this, but by doing this exercise, it starts to envision possibilities for partnerships um, in your communities um, to create active outdoor environments as we're all negotiating um, the pandemic. Um, so those are, those are, that's the, the, the three examples that we're giving. And then um, Tara, I'll let you speak to some of the Newcastle County libraries because I know you've been thinking about some of those as well. And Diana, do you wanna, do you wanna introduce? Yeah, I, I would appreciate that because um, for our staff, this uh, is a great introduction. Um, just a little background. So there are 10 Newcastle County libraries and there are five additional independent libraries. Mm -hmm. The 10 Newcastle County libraries have grown over the past 30 years through an initial master plan. Um, but that was very, very focused on capital construction. Mm -hmm. And so at the end of that master plan, we still had some capital projects to go. And for staff members who are relatively new to Newcastle County and have not gone through the public engagement process that we went through for each of those libraries, um, it's very similar to what you have presented today. Mm -hmm. um, but it's been done at an individual level and it's been a challenge because for each library we did, library programs and services had changed dramatically from the previous project. Mm -hmm. So uh, the Route 9 library, which was designed as a library and innovation center, you know, had a commercial kitchen and our first maker space. So a lot of the planning that we did was for those spaces that were totally new to mm -hmm. not just Newcastle County, but also Delaware. And I wanna note that the interior designer for that project, as well as um, our newest library, the Southern Library in Middletown is on this call. Um, and uh, I'm glad that she is, so we can kind of tap into the, the work that you're doing here. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't, I don't want uh, for people to think that um, there's no planning that has gone before this, but we're really entering a new era. And mm -hmm. I think your focus on, um, you know, some of the, I've, I've been taking really good notes and, um, that your focus on you know creating virtual programming consortiums and libraries as social service distribution centers. I mean, those are totally new concepts mm -hmm. that um, I think we'll we'll be looking at as we move forward. Mm -hmm. So that is um, basically what I wanted to say. But there's there's one other thing that's happened during the pandemic, and that is that um, in Newcastle County our division of libraries is actually part of a much larger department that includes housing and community resources, which does a lot of uh, programming. And it's so some of the, the things that say a Denver or St. Louis uh, library system does, those services are actually coming out through different divisions, which may not be clear to our library staff but um, the Newcastle County has just used CARES funds to purchase a local hotel, which uh, Margaret, if you're driving up and down the interstate, you will drive right by the former Sheraton Hotel, which as of December 15th is being turned into a homeless shelter. Mm. So that's a huge initiative <laughs> that's coming out of our department. And I think there'll be some role for libraries to provide some outreach there. So that's like the next big thing that we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, but in addition to that, because we haven't been able to do programming in our buildings, we're really developing a much closer partnership with community resources, which is the division that's always done our huge events. 
And just looking at, you know, what you've outlined, say for Rehoboth, it's actually our sister division that's typically been tasked with doing that type of programming. Mm -hmm. But what I can see happening is when we get to Newcastle County and we do this presentation for our um, administration, that really is going to be appropriate to bring community resources in um, because they, they will be great partners and they have mm -hmm. a lot of expertise in you know, doing the, the type of programming that you're showing. Mm -hmm. So that's basically my introduction. Great. Well, I, you know, I realized, you know, we're, as we're in the draft mode, we're kind of plowing along one foot in front of the other with all of our library. Um, and Brandywine is one of the libraries that we've already started to look at. Um, and I'm um, Tara's going to start. It's not as beautifully designed as the as the presentation that we have here yet, but you, you we can bring that up to start seeing some of those ideas. Um, but Brandywine is an interesting um, library because it's in the middle of a park, um, as y'all know, um, and so it has a lot of opportunities. Um, we've been seeing a lot of opportunities around. Um, activating those exterior spaces. Um, and you know, Margaret, one thing that I don't think, I don't know if the manager shared with you, but they are a site of a summer camp that's run by our community resources division. Mm -hmm. And that camp, if you, I, I don't know if you actually went to Brandywine and saw the pavilions that are there, but those, those spaces, you know, with mm -hmm. the summer camp that operates between the library and those pavilions, um, yeah, there's some great opportunities mm -hmm. to enhance those camps. Mm -hmm. And also um, Serena had, was identifying the, that there had been a cafe, um, but we were looking at ways to even evolve that outside with like, you know, the kind of hot dog stand that could, could capture the passerbys that are walking on the- And again, our community resources, they're, they're very familiar with that because mm -hmm. they, they're the ones that do our large events like mm -hmm. Sleep Under the Stars and the Ice Cream Festival, but they've typically operated at other venues, not, not you know, libraries have been an island because mm -hmm. we have been so busy just handling the people walking in our doors. Mm -hmm. And that's been our biggest challenge is that because we've had this incredible uh, capital construction program and we've basically been opening a new library every couple of years, we're just mm -hmm. you know, drawing a lot of people in mm -hmm. and that hasn't really stabilized. So mm -hmm. it's, you know, we haven't looked out. We've just been really focused on dealing with what's walking through our doors. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm, I'm gonna see if, um, Tara, can you send, I guess, do you have sharing capabilities or do you need to send the, the initial thoughts about branding on to me? I can give her sharing capabilities. No. Let me, um, okay, now Tara, you should be able to share. You need to stop sharing the. And do I need to stop? Okay. There we go. Sorry, I lost my Zoom tab. Um, Margaret, I think it would be better if you shared because I have it on the remote desktop, so it's going to be blurry. Okay. Will you just send it to me too? All righty. Sounds good. And I think, you know, Brandywine's a little bit like a Rehoboth where you've got the opportunity to, to delve into lots of ideas that can then get translated into other locations. So it's a good one to look at.
Okay, so we have Brandy line up. Okay, great. Oh, I have a doc. Good. All righty, there we go. All righty, Tara, I'll let you give us the world tour. Yeah, so um, Brandywine is really special in that it has like a huge amount of outdoor space. It has this um, great colonnade that we found that would be great for opportunities. They also have um, outlets outside in their former cafe area and um, stadium seating. And they're also really close to, they're on the side of a massive park. Um, that we thought would be really great for opportunities to partner with the park and like the people who come who come pretty often to like engage in activities. So this is a general look and feel of things that we're thinking about for brand new wine. So um, this one so for Brandywine, our strategic areas of focus, we're thinking were literacy, entertainment, and creativity. And we're thinking of mostly activating um, their huge side yard and possibly the baseball field um, across the street. So these are just um, preliminary sketches of um, thinking about how we'd activate under the colonnade with like a community living space and also um, putting computers close to the building and then their um, semi-circular stage area could be used <clears throat> for a story time or um, pop-up performances and shows and then having the outskirts be lined with um, opportunities for local artwork or um, food or a farmer's market that could draw people to the library. And then also possibly having like food trucks and um, places for the families to sit and eat and hang out. And we're also thinking about games. Mm -hmm. And then again, just getting to the cost that we're looking at. So, and more, and even here, I think we were looking at how to integrate um, intentionally with with parks and rec um, and the community um, partners. And then different costs. Oh, so there, there we go. That's our show. That's where we are in progress. So we'd love to open it up for questions and conversation. This is great, Margaret. So um, my, my question is, so what are next steps? So we've seen four libraries. So when will we get to see all of them? And um, you know, so what's your timeline? And so um, our next steps is by by um, by January we'll have all of the libraries completed um, time wise. Um, and Annie, I think that that's aligning with your budget cycle, right? Uh. Well, as far as um, because we the so Jeff has submitted the request. So we're asking for bond bill money for mm -hmm. for construction. We're getting some questions. Mm -hmm. This is going to pay for tents and mm -hmm. things. So uh, we'll, we'll need to check with Courtney. I don't know okay. if she's on or not, but um, you know, because I was thinking for you know for wiring in order to put mm -hmm. computers outside and um, that sort of thing, and maybe some built-in furniture. Um, but anyway, so so Jeff has sub submitted it. The governor's recommended budget comes out in January. I think mm -hmm. it will be in there, uh, and then they um, they don't vote on it. The legislature doesn't finalize it until uh, by June thirtieth. So we won't make it certain until July one. Mm -hmm. um, but I did want to say to the libraries that we have, um, and we've mentioned this before. We have bought some like. Uh, lightweight, the card tables. I think Alta has some uh, awning type tent things. Um, so we have some of those that libraries can use and we can buy more of those if there's, you know, that sort of thing. So once you have the whole list, mm -hmm. see some of what you're recommending, there's some things maybe we can buy uh, on state contract that would mm -hmm. be helpful. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, so we, I think our goal is, as Annie's saying, our goal is that we give you all a roadmap that you can take in lots of different ways. So there might be some low hanging fruit options for um, realignment of furniture. Um, and then also, you know, once we get this first schematic out to you all, um, we'll want, we'll schedule time to have get feedback um, from everyone um, so that we can continue to refine it um, to, to make sure that your feedback at seeing these initial ideas is incorporated into the final deliverable. Um, that it'll, that'll be used, you know, we're both in, the deliverable is intended to also be a rapid relief um, opportunities as well as some long-term strategic visioning as you start to build, um, build the pennies um, through the CIP funding that can go with um, taking It'll give you the opportunity to do things with, you know, sometimes we call it the IKEA approach, kind of the inexpensive furniture pieces, and then see what works, and then um, build in your budgets for the future, the furniture that would stay forever, um, right. have to do the outdoor furniture that can support um, the the activity and programs long term. But I think what's really exciting about um, what Annie and the team's leadership um, is offering for you all is the opportunity to use this time to really get your services outside um, to make visible the awesome things that you're doing. And also one of the things that we're hearing that's coming out of, particularly in New York where there's so much activity happening in the streets is that it's building inclusivity and cultural relevancy in more visible ways. And that's really interesting and exciting kind of um, benefit. Um, so working with Diana, Serena, Nick, it's just been, and Katie, it's just been so much fun to, um, to build a, a vision um, of activities and programs for all of you all. Great, thank you. Thanks, Margaret. I, I, I'm checking to see if any questions come in. Um, let's see. You have any uh, words about any of the uh, Kent County libraries? I'm not sure. Um, I know not every library took advantage of um, your services. I, I don't know uh, how many in Kent. So maybe I, you know, I, that's why I have to have my diagram because y'all yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, y'all know these by heart, and I'm still right. swimming in all the different um, counties. Um, let me I'm gonna, let me get back to the diagram to know. All which, Kent County, she says all Kent County libraries. So that's uh, Dover and oh Smith, yeah, yes, Harrison. yeah. So we, you know, and the fun thing about Dover is um, I was on the design team that actually um, was part of the original building. So yes, we, we've got Dover. We, Tara and I actually visited Dover when we were up earlier in October. So yeah, we're starting to get some plans for those. Okay. The county one, yeah. Good. Okay, yeah. good. Thank you, thank you, yep. Good, four and, and sometimes Milford. <laughs> <laughs> Milford sits on the line. On the so how are y'all, how are y'all feeling about what you're seeing? Are you seeing things that you're, you're getting excited about? Are you seeing some things that you could implement um, with some low hanging fruit? I, I, it's Diana. Sorry, I don't have uh, my camera hooked up, but um, it looks great and it looks like what we were hoping to see. So thank you for generating some uh, positive energy, which I think we really need here. It's great. Yeah, and of course, you know, my, um, my primary concern is the, um, as I said, the social services, the basic needs support. Mm -hmm. And helping people in crisis mm -hmm. and libraries are already doing that but mm -hmm. when support that uh, but I think it's going to this is long term uh, and I love what you said about um, in New York uh, 
that's making library services more visible mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. a value that I think you know this we're developing something that can be used in multiple ways into the future so mm -hmm. it's awesome well thank you if uh, we don't have uh, more questions for Margaret then um, we we're at the end of our agenda um, so thank you Margaret and thank you um, we have a, for closing today we have first we have a, a poll I think Serena's gonna and this is just one of the, uh, just a fun little poll silly poll uh, for those who haven't uh, <laughs> experienced a zoom poll before so well, she gets that ready so she's going to bring up the poll so you can vote so how many rolls of toilet paper do you currently have and just click on it and hit the submit button because we have to go back to reality now <laughs> <laughs> So Serena, how's the results coming? We have 85% voted. <laughs> we'll just give you a few more seconds. It looks like we're stopped at 85. So I'm going to go ahead and end the poll and see if I can share it with you. Who needs to stop up before the governor's briefings? Oh, bulk packs. <laughs> So we are ready for ready for what's next. That's awesome. We are all in good shape. <laughs> We're in great shape, at least with toilet paper anyway. So um, I wanna thank you all for uh, coming here today. I would especially thank the um, DDL staff for supporting this, Serena and a um, bunch of, a dozen other uh, DDL staff are helping with this as well. Um, and. Serena, if you can bring up the uh, the anniversary slide, just a reminder as we head into uh, 2021, that it is the 120th anniversary. You're seeing it here first. I'm hoping that um, that we can capitalize on that in some way. So think about how we might use that to feature libraries in. Uh, in the next year. So thank you everyone. Oh, it's coming. <laughs> there it is. All right, so here's our um, logo that we'll be using for 2021. And think about how we can uh, work on this together. We've been through 2020 together, we're going into 2021 together. And so how can we, um, use that, uh, capitalize on it. So thank you everyone for your participation today. Uh, as we go forth, be, be proud, be safe and be resilient. And we'll see you next time. Thank you everyone. Thank you, Annie, great job. Thank, thank you. you, Annie. Thank you everybody. <laughs> Thanks, Tracy. Bye from Newcastle Library. Goodbye. <laughs> See you later.